الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بأبده سبحان سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Our interaction with our environment that surrounds us and that nourishes us is such a immense sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you were to actually reflect upon it and interact with it and interact within it and think about it it just totally puts you at a loss of words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs are so deep and so plentiful and so awe-inspiring that not only do they produce a result of shock and awe in a human being but they leave a human being speechless so much so that in places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described his mercy you'll see that the word subhanallah is used now, subhanallah is so difficult to actually translate but actually the way you should think about subhanallah is that it is a phrase that's uttered when you are just at such a loss of words because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's glory his magnificence his wealth, his treasure, his blessing, it just so overcomes you and so drowns you and so takes over you that you don't even know what to say. Now we so quickly pass off this phrase, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. We use the phrase so lightly, but actually you have to think. It's, it's kind of like the word impressive. Like somebody says to you, that was impressive. And people just throw the word around, impressive. What do you mean? You know what impressive means? Impressive means it impressed upon you. You know, it changed you. It affected you. That's what Im impressive means. So when you say that something was impressive, what you're really saying is that it affected you in such a way that it impressed an idea upon you. It impressed a notion upon you. It impressed an emotion upon you. It stabilized something in your heart. That's what impressive means. Similar with the phrase subhanAllah. It's that type of phrase that is used when a human being becomes so enamored with something, some characteristic or quality or creation or sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how you have to think about the phrase. Now, for example, I'll just give you a couple of examples. They're just common examples. And you, you have heard about them. One is from the Quran, one is from Salah. But it just gives you an idea of what we mean by, by subhanAllah. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the fact that he took the Prophet wasallam from this world and raised him all the way up to the heavens. The phrase that's used to describe that whole idea is subhanAllah. Right? Because look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins that su surah. After A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi Subhanallah. Right? Subhanallah. Glory be to him who caused his servant to travel by the night. Now, what's actually occurring here, you have to think about the, you have to think about the actual background in order to understand the phrase being used. Actually what had happened was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a mortal human being, one of the created, despite the fact that he was the perfect creation, and then raised him up in a spectacular, miraculous way, all the way up in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And allowed that individual to interact with Allah in a way that no human being has ever done. Or no, none of creation has ever done, actually. And that actual event should be so inspiring. It should be so, it should just so overcome you that you have no phrase left to describe it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the phrase subhanallah asra. Glory be to he who caused him to travel by the night. So that's one example. Take another example. When a person enters into salah, 
Okay, now, remember that there's two types of Mi'raj. There's a Mi'raj of the Prophet ﷺ, which was his ascension. And then, there's a Mi'raj of all the people who follow the Prophet ﷺ, which is Salah. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the Mi'raj of the Mu'min is Salah. Now, in the same way, so, when we have that opportunity to interact with Allah and raise ourselves, right, and actually communicate with Allah one-on-one on one and enter into that special state called Salah, how do we begin it? Right, we do the takbir, which locks us into salah. We tie our hands, and the very first thing we say, Subhanakallahumma. Right? Glory be to you, O Allah. So again, that same phrase. Actually, what's happening is that we are entering into salah, and it's such a deep interaction. It's such a unique interaction. There is nothing equal to it. The fact that we've been blessed with it, all of these concepts should completely drown us. We should just be lost in thankfulness. And actually what happens then is once you say that Allahu Akbar, the whole world has been thrown behind you. You have this incredible interaction with Allah. You've tied your hands. Now you're focused on Allah. You're standing right before Him. Your attention is on Him and His attention is on you. Then you're sitting there and you have no phrase left to say. What can a human being say after that? So what do you have to say? Subhanak Allahumma. Glory be to you, O Allah. That you even allowed this interaction, that you permitted me to, to be with it, to take, take part in this interaction. So again, that same phrase, subhanAllah, arises in another context. And you'll find, in many places in the Quran, in many places in hadith, this whole phrase of subhanAllah highlights this notion every single time. Now, actually what made me think about this, or what made me raise the issue, is that this past weekend... I had the opportunity to travel to Hawaii. And there, there is so much nature. I had never seen that much nature in one place as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally, you can be like, you can go to these places where, you know, right along the Pacific Ocean, where you just put your face in the water, and you put your face in the water and you see 20, 30 different fish with different colors, you know, swimming within reef, and it just totally floors you. You have nothing to do except to say subhanAllah. There is this boat that they have there. And on this boat, what you do is you go, it's actually made for children and people who can't swim. So what you do is you sit in this boat and the boat has a glass bottom. Okay, the whole boat is angled and it's a glass bottom. And you sit in that glass bottom and it takes you across the ocean floor and through that glass bottom you see the entire ocean. And it was just so amazing. I was shocked. I was shocked at the fact that there's a whole world there. Now, when you look at that whole world, there actually there are these fish, and they're multiple colors. They're shining. They're reflecting back at you. Some are green. Some are highlighted. Some are not highlighted. The reef is... The whole place was like a whole other world. You never even think that that exists. And actually, it highlights two things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that really just can impress. When you say impressive, this impresses on someone's heart. First, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can never be escaped. No matter where you go, no matter who you are, you are constantly surrounded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine, people that go into the ocean so regularly, most people don't, but the people who do, even when you're out in the ocean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala signs drowned you out completely. There may not even be a human being there and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs are still uh, abound. That's the first thing. The second thing that actually amazed me was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's treasure is so vast that even in a place where no one is, he, it's completely decorated. The entire place, even in a place where there is no person present, the entire ocean floor was just decorated. And that was, subhanAllah, that was just incredible. Now, the example of this would be, for let's say that someone builds a house. Right? If you go to, a, if you go to someone when they're building a house, and you go into their basement in the laundry room, right? it tends to be not decorated. It tends to have just a simple floor. It tends to not have carpeting. It tends to not have tile. It tends to just be the standard floor. So they ask the person, well, why didn't you finish decorating this part of the house? Well, they say, well, this is the attic, this is the laundry room, this is, we don't decorate this part of the house because it's just a waste of money, nobody's gonna see it. 
right? So when you're thinking about areas to decorate, the people, even people of wealth, they say, well, no one is going to see this area, so we don't need to decorate it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's treasure is so vast, and His wealth is so expansive, that even in a place where no human being may ever go, deep, deep down in the depth of the ocean floor, He still decorated it and highlighted it with His signs. Because His wealth is so abundant, it makes no difference to him to decorate that area. It doesn't change his wealth whatsoever. It just goes to show you that even when there is no one, there are still the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, this highlights a principle in Arabic grammar. Now, if you think about it, for those of you who have been studying Arabic grammar, you'll know that when you have three base letters, those three base letters connote a meaning. For example, Hamada means to praise. Okay? So, one word is Hamid. Hamid is the one who praises. Another word that's derived from, from Hamim and Dal is Mahmud, the one that is praised, right? But if you look at the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his descriptors is Hamid, right? Hamid. You know, Hamid means that entity that is praised even when there is no one to praise that entity. That's what Hamid means. Take another example, it becomes clear. Sami'a means to listen. Sami' is the one who hears. Masmur is the thing that was heard. And then Samir means that entity, that individual who hears, even if there's no sound to be heard. Meaning their characteristic of hearing is not dependent upon sound. For example, if you tell me I'm listening, then I have to say, what are you listening to? It's dependent, right? Your listening is dependent upon sound. There has to be sound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's characteristic of listening is such that he's Samir. He's not Samir. He's Samir. They translate it as all hearing, if you look through like the tafsirs. But actually, it's much more than that. It means that irrespective of sound, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears. Irrespective of someone praising, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praised. Inherently, with or without someone praising. So that goes to show you that anywhere in the universe, even if there, I'll tell you, there are places where no human being has ever been. And still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decorated that place, and that place is continuously praising Him. So, what it goes to show you, and from the first part of the talk, is that conceptually, for the person who is seeking Allah, who remembers Allah, who is constantly seeing the signs of Allah, the only response is, subhanAllah. That's actually the response. That We don't, we don't even know how to respond. Put it that way. When we interact in this way with the environment, when we reflect on the environment in this way, when we interact with one another, we have no response. What are you supposed to say? Wow, that's incredible. Okay, that's incredible, but it still doesn't get to it. And so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually teaches us to use the phrase subhanAllah. When you think about the Isra and Mi'raj, you're forced to say subhanAllah. Right? When you think about the fact that you entered into salah, you're, in, you're, you're engaging in this incredible interaction, you're forced to say subhanAllah. So this phrase, although we use it, what I want to highlight is that this phrase, we tend to throw it off our tongue without thinking about what it really means, but actually it has a very, very deep meaning. So any time you use this phrase, you should recognize, now there's two ways to interact. One way is to interact with the environment and say, okay, subhanAllah, because of my interaction with the environment. The other thing to recognize is that Allah taught you to say subhanAllah, so you should be thinking, where is it? What's causing that, subhanAllah? Right? So there's two ways of looking at it. And both are extremely important for that person who seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that creates, it's impressive. It creates change in a person. It creates a level of, uh, a, a level of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing else can create. So it's important that we, when we look at things that we recognize that. Now, the other thing that you recognize is the fact that there is, there is a Muslim community here is just one of those blessings that just floors you to say, subhanAllah. When you go to a place like that, despite the incredible nature, despite the incredible signs of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite the fact that you're forced, you're forced to say, subhanAllah, so many people there don't have Islam. In fact, very few people there have Islam. There's barely any community there. But, and, and that should actually raise the idea in your mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put you in a place and a time and amongst a group of people that remind you to remember that everything is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It's not random. It's not, it's, it's not random. It's Allah's choosing. You don't find people randomly distributed throughout the earth. You find Allah puts people together in groups. Now, that group exists in this world, and that same group will be the group that will travel together in the hereafter. Basically, when you look at one another, these are your, these, this is your company for a very long journey. Our journey begins here, and on the day of judgment, when people are running around and recognizing one another, you will recognize the exact same group of people. Now, you'll recognize this group of people, and then this, as a group, we'll recognize our teachers. And as a group, they'll recognize their teachers. And as a group, they'll recognize their teachers until it goes back to the Tabi'een, the Sahaba, and the Prophet ﷺ. That whole chain will then become a chain of people that will travel together on the Day of Judgment. And then, inshallah, as they travel together on the Day of Judgment, they'll also be led into Jannah together. Right? It goes as a group. And that should make you say, subhanAllah, because I'm telling you, most people in the world don't have that. Even in a Muslim country, it's very hard to find a group of people that sit and Allah gives, and they sit and reflect upon Allah. Right? They use the environment to think about Allah. They make a conscious decision that they want to submit to Allah. They follow the path of the Messenger of Allah. They interact and memorize the Book of Allah. It doesn't exist all over the world. The fact that you have that gathering, the fact that you have that group of people, the fact that we have teachers above us who have guided us this far, all of that forces you to say subhanAllah. There's no word that I can ever give for that except subhanAllah. Right? It, in, instead of our lives being a salah five times a day, our whole life becomes like a salah. Because of the fact that we had teachers to guide us along this path. Because of the fact that we had teachers that opened our eyes to the realities of the universe. So, actually, we are so, so dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, for opening our eyes to His realities. Two, for creating an environment around us that constantly reminds us of Him so that there is no way but to remember Allah. And three, for creating a group of people around us that remind us that that is our purpose in life, that that is our goal, and that is, that, that is our destination. So really, really, there is no phrase, there is no phrase that we can use except SubhanAllah. So when you say that phrase, when you think about that phrase in Salah, when you do the tasbih of that phrase, right, you should always think about how deep and what, how deep that interaction is and what you're really saying when you use it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be among those who continuously call upon His name and to be among those who are continuously floored by His environment and are continuously uh, reflecting on His greatness by, the, by using the phrase subhanAllah.